Good morning, and welcome to the 38th Annual Department of Preventive Medicine and Biostatistics Graduation Ceremony. I'm Kara Olson, Vice Chair of Graduate Programs in the Department and host of today's celebration. Because of the global pandemic, the Department is holding a virtual commencement ceremony this year. This event honors graduate students who will receive degrees in public health and health administration and policy. We are joined online by distinguished guests, faculty, staff, and most importantly, students and their families. As we begin the ceremony, I would like to welcome members of the official party, Dean of the School of Medicine, Dr. Eric Elster, Chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine and Biostatistics, Colonel James Mancuso, and keynote speaker and university chaplain, Commander David Alexander. Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem will be performed by the USU Dermatones. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars oh, the as fight oh, the At the end of this ceremony, we will have graduated a total of 858 Master of Public Health, 77 Master of Science in Public Health, 62 Master of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, 92 Master of Health Administration and Policy, 22 Doctor of Philosophy, and 33 Doctor of Public Health students. I would like to thank those who planned the graduation. Tina Johnson did the behind the scenes work and Talina Robinson contributed. Major Benjamin Weir and Lieutenant J.G. Anquinette Sterling are the student representatives on the planning team. Next, I would like to introduce our department chair, Colonel James Mancuso, who will share a few words with our graduates. Former students, now colleagues, congratulations on this important achievement. Graduation with a master's or doctoral degree from the Uniformed Services University. This is an important accomplishment and milestone in your military and professional careers and you are now our colleagues and peers in the practice of public health and health services administration. This has been an unusual year, to say the least, and I'm grateful to you for the patience, determination, and motivation you've all demonstrated to meet all the challenges of this largely virtual past year. I'm also thankful for the outstanding support by the faculty and staff in helping the students meet these challenges. When you look back on your time at USIS this past year, I hope you remember it as a once in a lifetime opportunity and experience, which was both professionally and personally rewarding. As graduates, you are all now ambassadors for USU who demonstrate the quality of the education at USU through your technical expertise, professionalism, and leadership. You are also ambassadors in the sense that you are best able to identify and recruit the very highest quality students and faculty at your next duty stations through your connections with others and your demonstration of the skills you developed during your education here at USU. Please remember the friendships and relationships you've made here along the way. I can tell you that what I remember and treasure most about each assignment I've had in the Army has been the unique and special friendships I've made along the way. I ask you all to continue to keep engaged with these professional relationships you've made during your time at USU with faculty and students alike. The public health community is small and many of you will no doubt come across each other again. 
some in your next assignment, others during a deployment. And I'm sure some of you will even come back here to USU as faculty. Again, my most sincere congratulations and best wishes to you and your families. I can't wait to hear about the amazing accomplishments and exploits from this class in the upcoming months and years. Thank you, Colonel Mancuso. Lieutenant J.G. Anquinette Sterling, MHAP class representative, will introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning, faculty, staff, guests, and fellow graduates. I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Commander David Alexander. Commander Alexander is both an active duty naval chaplain and social scientist, specializing in psychosocial research with refugees and asylum seekers at home and abroad. He is a graduate of Fordham University in New York City and St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary in Yonkers, New York. He completed his PhD and postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Trauma, Asylum and Refugees at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Chaplain Alexander has served 16 years in the Navy and has worked with survivors of political violence in more than a dozen countries, including Afghanistan, Syria, the Sudan, Cyprus, the Republic of Georgia, and Japan. Chaplain Alexander currently manages a research program at the Consortium for Health and Military Performance and serves as the USU's campus chaplain and a faculty member in the School of Medicine. It is my pleasure to welcome today's keynote speaker, Commander David Alexander. It's such an honor to speak with you, uh, to be your keynote speaker for graduation. Uh, I want to offer my warmest congratulations to the graduates of the Master of Public Health or MS in Public Health programs, the Master of Health Services Administration and Policy program, the Master of Tropical Medicine uh, and Hygiene. Um, congratulations, warm congratulations for all the work that you've put into your program. I think I was asked to speak today based on a talk I gave <laughs> to the graduate school a few weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago now, uh, and I was asked to give something like the same uh, talk today. I, I don't give the same talks twice. I, I was uh, taught by an important mentor of mine many years ago not to mimic myself. That you don't step into the same river twice. Uh, rivers are always changing. You don't talk to the same person twice. People are always changing. You're never the same person twice uh, when you're giving a, a different talk to a different audience on a different day. But what I'll try to do today is to capture something similar, which is to speak about how, uh, in this case, fresh graduates from a graduate program entering the field often are able to contribute something, see something, be sensitive to something that their more seasoned peers who have been in the field longer may miss because of their uh, um, acclimatization to managed care. The hardened professionals sometimes miss things that new professionals catch. And I'm going to be speaking to you specifically from the field of uh, humanitarian assistance and refugee care. It's gonna start with the story about a remarkable woman named Daria. So Daria is a refugee from South Sudan. She fled from South Sudan some years ago. By the way, uh, I'm, we're calling her Daria, but we'll protect her anonymity. Um, she escaped uh, from a, a very, very serious situation in South Sudan, and she spent some years in a camp called Dadaab, which is on the Kenya-Somali border. Actually, they're talking of closing Dadaab, uh, which will be, I, I think, uh, quite, um, quite an undertaking because there are uh, many, many tens of thousands of people at, at Dadaab. It has been open for decades. There are people that are born in Dadaab and die in Dadaab, uh, having lived uh, to their life expectancy. And they've never seen a tree. They've never encountered a, a, a mountain. It is a place with a subculture all its own. And many people who come into Dadaab are never resettled. Uh, they never end up uh, in, a, in a, a place of their choosing, a, a place they long to go. Uh, in, in the asylum claims, people end up staying at Dadaab for, for, as I mentioned, a very long time. Actually, Daria was resettled to the UK with her entire family. Now, the, the idea that she fled from her town uh, and made it intact with her family, which includes her husband. Her, husband uh, her and her husband have two adult sons. They have uh, spouses and a number of children which are Daria's grandchildren. They all actually were granted asylum together and sent to Heathrow 
in the United Kingdom, which if you've ever flown into the United Kingdom, chances are you landed at Heathrow. And a remarkable, actually, story that they were all uh, able to survive intact and end up in Heathrow. Uh, her, her husband and also her sons were given uh, work placement at the airport in Heathrow. Good, a good uh, paying job, um, something that could sustain them and their family. And they were also placed in a community of a number of other uh, uh, resettlers from Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, actually, in many ways, a beautiful story, but Daria began to uh, experience some difficulties about a year, a little over a year uh, after she was resettled in Heathrow. She began to uh, lose her appetite. She began to have trouble keeping uh, predictable sleep cycles. She entered into what she was calling dark moods, persistently low moods, and she even thought about dying. This concerned her family very much. It concerned her various helpers in the community very much. And she went to see a series of specialists who had different ideas and, of course, different uh, helping lanes to try to uh, help her to regain some of her function and to, uh, to, be, uh, to adaptively reintegrate into family and life and rhythm. One thing that was in the notes uh, from a lot of Doria's contacts with these various specialists was this theme of darkness. She would say, uh, um, this is a dark time for me. This is a dark time for my family. I have dark thoughts. I have dark ideas. She would also say, the transition point here, uh, she, I am in darkness. I'm in the dark. Almost a poetic language. And uh, there is a group of people at the Tavistock Clinic in East London, which is a, a important center within the National Institutes of Mental Health for the United Kingdom that is dedicated to refugee care. In fact, many former refugees or children of refugees who train in integrative counseling, psychology, family therapy, whatever it might be, a helping profession, end up working through this center, sometimes pro bono, sometimes as a part of their work, and seeing other people uh, who uh, are struggling to integrate, uh, struggling with their asylum status or whatever it might be, to offer helping resources to fellow refugees. At a consultation within uh, this, uh, within the refugee care uh, uh, conglomerate at the Tavistock Clinic, there was a new graduate from a graduate program uh, who actually herself was uh, from of Middle Eastern descent, but had worked in Sub-Saharan Africa. And people were talking about Daria's situation in various ways, but this fresh graduate was the one who offered, uh, she said, do you think actually Daria's idea about the darkness could be, uh, could be a reference to an ecological factor? The very fresh way of thinking. Nobody else had been thinking about it in her various specialty uh, uh, consultations, Daria's various specialty consultations. No one had been thinking about it in the consulting room at Tavistock. But this one fresh student who had worked some in Sub-Saharan Africa suggested it, introduced the idea, and one of the helpers brought it up with Daria. As it turns out, as Daria considered this, she began to feel like a lot of her distress uh, had to do with something like an ecological factor. You see, Daria was, of course, raised in Sudan. In the sub-Saharan Africa climate in which she was raised, there is no overcast day. <laughs> I mean, the, it's an it's a equatorial region. The sun is very predictable. The sun rises and sets generally at the same time every day of the year. And actually, you can see the sun predictably uh, throughout every day of the year. Very few, as I said, overcast days. So actually, Daria, when she grew up, she didn't have a clock in her home. She knew when to get up and begin going about her business when the sun was at a certain place in the sky. She knew when her husband and her uh, sons would be going out to their uh, uh, opportunities, to their work placements and to their activities, when the sun was at a certain place in the sky. She went out to draw water at the river when the sun was at a certain place in the sky. She knew when to begin preparing meals when the sun was at a certain place in the sky. She expected her family to come back from their various activities and come back together in the evening when the sun was at a certain place in the sky. She knew it was time to prepare for rest when the sun was at a certain place in the sky. And it wasn't that different in Dadaab. But in Heathrow, of all places in the Western world, I mean, Heathrow must be among the top five or 10 places in terms of overcast days. It must be overcast 290 days a year. Actually, for Daria to say she was in the dark, to have this theme of darkness uh, just ensconced in her language about her distress as she understood it, it had everything to do actually with an ecological idea. And this gave her helpers one of the interpretive keys they were looking for to begin to help her 
to install some full spectrum lighting, to make sure that the family was able to get away from time to time to sunnier places, to, uh, to help Daria make use actually of what sunny days there were <laughs> in a more predictable way. And actually just to kind of figure in and begin to grieve and mourn the loss of home in a way that she hadn't in the midst of her ideas of being grateful of getting placed. And by the way, the entire system uh, of replacement w was giving her the cues that she should be nothing but grateful that she had been settled in such a wonderful place with so many wonderful opportunities. A place though, where she descended into the dark. And beginning to understand these things and, and appreciate them, this was part of Daria's reintegration. So what's the point of this story? I just offer a couple of things to all of us. You, you graduates are going to be involved in systemic healthcare, whether you're uh, from a public health perspective, from an administrative pr perspective, whatever it might be, there is some, something special that can be contributed by fresh graduates. Managed care hasn't yet fully, I, I, I would think, <laughs> hasn't fully uh, demanded so much of your attention and so much of your frames of reference that you can't bring a fresh perspective when you come. Managed care is all about putting people in their distress into set categories so their care can be, well, uh, maximally, optimally managed. But people are often lost in that system to some extent because there is no one-size-fits-all approach to working with human beings. So uh, capturing, uh, harnessing your idealism that got you into this field, your hopes when you were starting this program maybe of making the world a better place in some small way by your contribution. You have something that you're bringing to the table that is fresh. And I say, hold on to your freshness. New graduates are often the most likely or the least likely to step into a work and be immediately bound by its frames of reference. Uh, most likely because there's some uh, pressure in the system for you to get it, talk like everyone else, do the things like everyone else does, adopt the language and the frames of the possibility for freshness because you are not yet hardened within that system. As long as you can, my humble suggestion is try to capture, to keep your freshness, to harness your freshness, to bring another perspective. The system actually needs it more than you know. And two small little sub uh, suggestions from there, and this is, will probably end here as one. Listen for ecological factors, or I might say less tangible factors when thinking about a person or a family's or a community's distress. Uh, so often we think of, of these tangible things, obviously, the physiological uh, uh, manifestations of distress, the psychological manifestations. We don't often think of ecology, the sights and the sounds and the smells and the rhythms and the architecture of the setting of our lives. And in the military, actually, we're often plucking up young people and throwing them to some other part of the country, you know, and, and hoping that they, they transplant well. It's hard to even make sense of the distress. It's hard to articulate. It's elusive to describe the distress people can come into when they're out of their element, when the, the fixed positions for the uh, predictability of life have been removed. Keep an eye on these things. And these less tangible factors, especially if you feel as if the tangible factors don't quite provide a perfect accounting for the distress that you're seeing. Be curious. Pull that thread. Often people will, will, will give you something you didn't see before, an interpretive key, if you're listening. And the last is very similar to that. I say always to helpers, listen to poetic language. We often in managed care are thinking within the, the linguistic framework, you might say, of uh, damage and repair. What damage is there and how can we repair it and be as efficient as possible? This is what our systems of managed care help us to do. Uh, and we do it well in, in some, uh, to some extent. But poetic language, instead of immediately trying to interpret it metaphorically to fit into our uh, more tangible structures or fit into our, uh, our, our linguistic frameworks of damage and repair, the poetics will often help you to know that there is uh, something else following poetic language like I am in the dark. Not we have lost this or this, but we are lost. When people begin asking big quest questions, why has this happened to me? How is it that we could move on like this? It's so easy in managed care to try to grab those things and fit them back in. No, wait a minute. What does it mean to be lost? When were you last oriented and felt different than you do now? What do you imagine, thinking back to your frame of, of reference for the world, what do you imagine it might look like to be found again? Often the children are often speaking to us poetically, and uh, 
I always say to people going into difficult situations, especially uh, you know after political violence or natural disasters, children are the hardest to look at in some ways. We have a hard time looking at suffering children, but children often will give us the key to understanding the resilience of their people. They're quickest to make new connections, to thrive, what good qualities they have that, that are coming out just spontaneously, if we're paying attention, will give us something to build on, et cetera, et cetera. So I offer you these three things. My hope for you as graduates, harness your fresh perspective. Don't get too hardened too quickly. You have something to offer with your freshness. And also, if you can, if you can create some space, be aware of these less tangible factors. If things seem too neat, they're probably oversimplified as you're approaching human distress. If they seem too too cute, too immediately, they fit too immediately, too cleanly into the categories, we might be missing something. And don't be afraid of following poetic language. People may offer you, open up in such a way when you're curious about their poetic language to show you where the real distress is or sources of distress and potential progressive ideas about how to move past distress that you wouldn't have seen from a fixed position just within the frame of reference of managed care. I'm so proud of all of you. Uh, I am rooting for all of you. It's hard to get into medicine and healthcare these days. Uh, there's a lot at stake. So I wish you all of the very best uh, in your future work. Thank you, Commander Alexander. Dr. Daryl Singer, the MPH Program Director, will now present awards to our MPH students. The Captain Richard Hooper Award is presented to the student who attains the highest score on their oral presentation of their MPH or MTMNH project. Captain Richard Hooper was a dedicated Naval Preventive Medicine physician and educator. Along with his medical school classmate and spouse, Dr. Tomoko Tony Hooper, they arrived at USU for the twilight of his career. Unfortunately, he was taken too early from his family, USU, and the naval career he loved so dearly. Dr. Tony Hooper, one of the core faculty who established and shaped the USU Public Health Program, established this award in his honor. The 2021 recipient of the Captain Richard Hooper Award is Lieutenant Commander Ernest A. Bear. Congratulations, Ernie. Every year, students in the Master of Public Health and Master of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene programs select one of their peers to receive the Esprit de Corps Award. The award reads, this individual is our colleague and friend, and by example, has inspired us all in our enjoyment of each other, our commitment to our profession, and our dedication to lifelong learning and public service. The 2021 recipient of the Esprit de Corps Award is Lieutenant Commander Laura Gilbert. Congratulations, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Each year, the Psi Chapter of the Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health at USUS inducts new members from among graduating students, faculty, and alumni based on academic performance and either potential or evidence of outstanding contributions to public health. At this time, Psi Chapter President Major Andy Chern and President-Elect Lieutenant Commander Amy Rogers will announce the induction of the new Delta Omega members. Greetings from sunny Charleston, South Carolina. My name is Dr. Andy Chern, the current president of Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health, Psi Chapter. Delta Omega was originally founded in 1924, and the USU chapter was established in 1996 with the purposes of recognizing excellence in public health practice, research, and academic achievement. At the end of each academic year, faculty, alumni, and students are inducted into the Psi Chapter. While USU continues to produce amazing graduate students in public health disciplines each year, we are only able to induct a limited number. This year's student inductees are Lieutenant Commander Laura Gilbert and Major Shoshana Zhang. Congratulations. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Amy Rogers. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Rogers, the Vice President of the Psi Chapter of Delta Omega, coming to you from Napoli, Italy. As Dr. Chern said, not only do we like to recognize the outstanding work of our master's in public health students, but also our alumni, faculty, and doctoral students. This year's inductees are Commander Marion Gregg, a graduate of our Preventive Medicine and MPH program, Dr. Raul Mirza, a graduate of our Occupational Medicine and MPH program, and Dr. Jenna Norton, the first alumni to be inducted due to her work in our PhD in public health program. 
Thank you and congratulations to all the inductees. Thank you, Major Chern and Lieutenant Commander Rogers. Lieutenant Commander Beth Hawks, the Program Director of the Master of Health Administration and Policy Graduate Program, will now present the Master of Health Administration and Policy Student Awards. Good morning, President Thomas, Dean Elster, Dr. Day, Colonel Mancuso, Commander Alexander, USU faculty and staff, friends, family members, and most importantly, the PMB class of 2021. As the director of the Master of Health Administration and Policy program, it is my distinct pleasure to present the two student awards, the Barbara Middleman Award and the Larry Lewin Leadership Award. The university presents the Barbara Middleman Award to the graduate with the best final graduate management project, the culminating work required of all of our students as evaluated by the Master of Health Administration and Policy program faculty. This year, the Barbara Middleman Award goes to Major Leif Vestermark, Medical Service Corps, United States Army. Congratulations, Major Vestermark. Next, the university presents the Larry Lewin Leadership Award. Larry Lewin made several meaningful contributions to the field of health administration and policy. The winner of the Lewin Award is chosen by his or her peers for their student leadership positive impact and selfless contributions to the student cohort. For the class of 2021, the Larry Lewin Leadership Award goes to Lieutenant Junior Grade Anquinette Sterling, Medical Service Corps, United States Navy. Congratulations, Lieutenant Sterling. Thank you, MHAP class of 2021 for your stellar performance and congratulations on your significant academic achievements. I am proud to have been your program director. I wish you all the very best as you move on to your next assignment in your career. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Hawks. Captain Michael Stevens will now present the Master of Science in Public Health Student Awards. Hello, I am Captain Mike Stevens, Director of the Occupational and Environmental Health Sciences Division of the Preventive Medicine and Biostatistics Department here at USU. Recipients of the OEHS Student Excellence Award are voted on annually by OEHS faculty. This award recognizes an OEH student who has shown exceptional achievement in academic excellence, quality and relevance of research, demonstration of critical thought, and an interest in lifelong learning. I am pleased to announce that this year, the OEHS faculty has selected Lieutenant Commander Brandon Parker as the 2021 recipient of the OEHS Student Excellence Award. During his two years in the OEHS program, Lieutenant Commander Parker has achieved many successes. He performed very well in his coursework, successfully completing 100 credit hours, while thoughtfully and meticulously developing a research plan arranging for and securing analytical equipment from the Indian Health Service, and ultimately testing and comparing different handheld analytical systems. Very impressively, especially to us faculty, he also created enhancements for an atmospheric test chamber apparatus, which permitted him to generate and analyze nitrous oxide over a range of concentrations and humidity levels. Lieutenant Commander Parker accomplished these feats while also facing considerable personal challenges back home to unfortunately include the loss of a dear family friend to COVID-19 over the past year. Lieutenant Commander Parker expertly presented his research findings as a speaker at the 29th Annual Joint Safety and Environmental Professional Development Symposium sponsored by the Naval Safety Center and also by presenting a poster at the 2021 USU Research Days. Lieutenant Commander Parker has displayed a persistence that is characteristic of the best officer researchers, and his resilience and meticulous attention to detail led him to the completion of a very relevant research effort for the Indian Health Service and sister services. So on behalf of the OHS faculty, I would like to offer Lieutenant Commander Brandon Parker our most sincere congratulations for earning this year's OEHS 
Student Excellence Award. Congratulations again, Brandon, very well done. Thank you, Captain Stevens. It is now my privilege to present this year's graduates. The following students are receiving the degree Master of Public Health. Lieutenant Simone Baker. Major James Corrigan. Lieutenant Commander Ernest Ebert. Lieutenant Colonel Sharla Geist. Lieutenant Commander Laura Gilbert. Major Barish Gunn. Lieutenant Colonel Ian David Gregory. Lieutenant Commander Ryan Hassan. Captain Tyler Hinshaw. Lieutenant Commander Ryan Catcher. Major Mike Lang. Lieutenant Colonel Sonia Molchan. Major Justin Peterson. Lieutenant Colonel Kimberly Phillips. Lieutenant Commander Vlad Stanila. Major Raman Tufan. Major Benjamin Weir. And Major Shoshana Zhang. The following students are receiving the degree Master of Health Administration and Policy. Captain David Callejas. Major Jin Cho. Captain Samantha Dews. Lieutenant JG Dana Farmer. Lieutenant JG Viviana Noguera. Lieutenant JG Emmanuel Okeke. Lieutenant JG Amaya Steck. Lieutenant JG Anquinette Sterling. Major Aaron Tompkins. Major Leif Vestermark. Lieutenant JG Willie Williams. And Lieutenant Brian Wilson. The following student is receiving the degree Master of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, Lieutenant Colonel Jessica Lotridge. The following student is receiving the degree Master of Science in Public Health, Lieutenant Commander Brandon Parker. Congratulations, Class of 2021. Once again, I would like to thank class representatives, Lieutenant J.G. Anquinette Sterling from the MHAP program and Major Benjamin Weir from the MPH program for their hard work and dedication throughout the year. Now, Major Benjamin Weir will present the awards for Outstanding Educator. Every year, the PMB graduating class recognizes at least one faculty member for their outstanding contributions in graduate education and excellence in teaching and mentoring students. This year, the MPH and MHAP cohorts performed separate votes, and one cohort vote ended in a tie giving us the opportunity to recognize three faculty. It is my absolute honor to present the awards to Colonel James Mancuso, Colonel Brad Botig, and Dr. Tracy Colmus. Thank you, Colonel Mancuso, Colonel Botig, and Dr. Colmus for all the work you do in preparing us to become strong public health and health administration professionals. Dr. Eric Elster, interim and incoming Dean of the School of Medicine, will now share a few words with our graduates. Thank you for attending our 2021 virtual graduation for the Department of Preventive Medicine. I would like to highlight some of the critical work that these new graduates just completed. Graduates in public health and health administration policy contribute to the local community while they are here. Captain David Kelly Ellis completed his administrative residency at Sibley Memorial Hospital. He contributed to the metrics portion of the Unity Sibley Telemedicine Council testimony presented to the Council of the District of Columbia Committee on Health and used it to understand the impact of telemedicine on seniors from disenfranchised communities and enact policies to serve them best. Other Master of Health Administration and Policy students completed projects that assist in designing or in some cases redefining policy, process, or care delivery to meet the needs of the institution's population at sites including Fort Belvoir, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, Johns Hopkins Suburban, Johns Hopkins Sibley, Defense Health Quarters Headquarters within the NCR market, the U.S. Department of State within Operational Medicine, and the Congressional Research Service. 
Dr. Laura Gilbert, a Master of Public Health graduate student, helped Knollwood, a local military retirement community, develop and implement their COVID-19 immunization plan. Their work also supports public health at a national level. Major Barris Gunn directly supported the Air Force Medical Readiness Agency by writing a tobacco cessation uh, situation background assessment recommendation tool specific to the global pandemic that was distributed throughout the U.S. Air Force. While at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Lieutenant Commander Ryan Hassan used publicly available data to calculate standardized incidence and mortality rates for the novel coronavirus in meatpacking plants and demonstrated that further safeguards were needed to better protect these workers contributing to action by the agency. And their research receives national exposure. Lieutenant Colonel Kimberly Phillips studied rates of musculoskeletal injury and behavioral health disorders in ground combat specialties, including infantry, cavalry armor, field artillery, and air defense positions. She presented her findings as a poster at the 2021 Women in Combat Summit through Uniformed Services University and as an oral presentation at the 2021 American Occupational Health Conference in May. Major Shoshana Zhang's research project entitled the Operational Medicine Pipeline International Approaches to Developing Occupational Medicine Expertise was reviewed by the International Occupational Medicine Society Collaborative, uh, prompting this body to develop specific action plans to advance the specialty of occupational and environmental medicine on a worldwide basis, and was one of two presentations that Major Zhang gave at the annual American Occupational Health Conference in May of 21. PME graduates are in a pipeline for leadership positions within the military health system. The MHAP class of 2021 will face new challenges as they take on assignments across the globe at locations such as Naval Hospital Guam, 4th Medical Battalion, Naval Hospital Yokosuka, Japan, and Baltimore, Germany, to name a few. Our graduating MPH residents will serve as preventive medicine officers, public health emergency officers, and in similar roles at sites including the United States Air Force Academy, USA FSAM Epidemiology Consult Service, the Air Force Medical Readiness Agency, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and Madigan, the Navy and Marine Corps Public Health Center, and Naval Medical Readiness Training Commands in Quantico, Hawaii, and Okinawa, just to name a few. And in the spirit of international cooperation, our Canadian Armed Forces graduate Lieutenant Commander Ebert will serve as Staff Officer, Communicable Diseases Control and Prevention, 4th Health Protection, and Canadian Armed Forces. I know these graduates will play a critical role across the globe in our national healthcare system and within the military health system. Thank you, Dr. Elster. I would like to acknowledge those PMB faculty members who have recently left the department or have planned to do so over the summer. Doctors Ted Benchoff, James Dunford, Austin Haig, Todd LaRue, Jitta Murphy, and Doug Whitaker. On behalf of the department, I would like to thank you for your service and wish you well in your future endeavors. You will be missed. Graduates, I want to take a moment to marvel at your resilience. Those of you who started your program two years ago could not have anticipated how the world would change while you were in graduate school. Those who started last summer had to deal with restriction of movement, quarantine, and other barriers to even start your graduate program. All of you had to deal with a sudden shift to virtual learning. As I read the student course evaluations for the past year, I expected to see a litany of concerns about the problems we experienced in our sudden shift to online classes. Instead, the typical comment said something like, I wish the class could be in person, but it's going well under the circumstances. This of course speaks to the faculty's ability to adjust on the fly, and I wanna give credit to them for making this work. But it also shows that you as a class are adaptable, positive, and open to new ways of learning. These traits will serve you well as you go on to your next assignments and are exactly what the services need. I'm proud to call you USIS alumni. As we draw to a close, our chaplain, Commander Alexander, will lead us in the benediction. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to pray with me. God who has upheld us through the long years of history, we gather today to honor a cohort of public health professionals and healthcare administrators who have spent thousands of hours preparing themselves for service to community and country at the next level. At no time in our history has the public relied more heavily upon its health services professionals. At no time 
in the nearly 50 years since our university was chartered by Congress has it been more crucial that we produce the finest future leaders in the field, like today's graduates, to take up posts in the service of the common good. At no time have our armed forces needed them more to keep our operators at the peak of readiness. At no time have our global allies needed them more to aid in public health responses. At no time have the most vulnerable countries in the world needed them more to participate in sensitive and culturally competent strategic health partnerships. Let these graduates have no doubt that their hard work and sacrifices have been worth it. We in attendance stand with them in solidarity today with gratitude and pride. Thank you, Commander Alexander. This concludes the 2021 graduation ceremony for the USU Department of Preventive Medicine and Biostatistics. Congratulations, graduates. Thank you.